And it's a long title too. So um, I know it's a mouthful, but I think as we go through it, hopefully some simple concepts will emerge. I'm gonna tell you a story about building a system that does this in a really specific sense. And my hope is that you kind of get the general concept because it's a really, it has some really interesting applications across a variety of systems. So let's start out um, talking a little bit about the context here. I work for a company called Clavio that does marketing automation, mostly for e-commerce companies. Um, that means we send a lot of email and SMS on behalf of this, the brands and the companies that use our services. And you probably have seen our stuff if you've ever been shopping online, put something in your cart, you get distracted, you go away, you come uh, close your computer, walk away. A couple hours later, you get an email reminding you about those shoes. There's a good chance that company used our product to configure and send that reminder. So that's the kind of territory we're in here. We also ingest all kinds of other data on behalf of those companies so that they can see the full set of interactions they have with their customers. Uh, specifically, I work on the sort of data and analytics layer that ingests all that raw data and makes it queryable to the other areas of our product so that we can answer targeted questions like, um, what was the performance of my last campaign? Who are my best customers? Uh, and Clavio has always had the goal of serving fast analytical data for our customers so they can answer a large variety of questions. That's what we're trying to do. Now, as our business has grown and evolved, we've changed the way we serve that data. And so, basically, I wanna tell you about the system that we're on today that serves a pretty wide range of workloads off the same set of raw data and the same compute layer that derives all that data on the fly. We put this system in place about a year and a half ago, um, and it was to replace an old system that did all this calculation when we ingested the data. So at right time, at the time we received raw events, we would roll them up into a million different aggregates and store that data, which was super fast and could cover a wide variety of, of answers to those questions. But as the business grew and as our customer base grew, that system, as you can imagine, becomes really unwieldy to maintain and manage. Right? It's expensive to store all that data and the operational complexity goes way up because every time you have a use case that doesn't fit the existing query patterns, you need to stand up a new data pipeline, you need to materialize the data, you need to store that data. So it, becomes a it became a real pain. Um, what I wanna emphasize with this, like, share, this is my best attempt at drawing a shared calculator, is that we have very different use cases coming in and using the same compute resources. So public facing APIs, internal dashboards, um, report generation for offline you know, downloadable data. And not only are they mixed in terms of the sources, the use cases, but the queries themselves, as if you think about all the questions you'd wanna answer about your interactions with your customers, right? You can be looking up a single point value at a snapshot in time, you can break down your um, data by week, by month, whatever, over long ranges of time. Like query complexity varies a lot too. So we, we designed a real-time system to serve this data. And when we launched it, it was fantastic. We were serving thousands of queries per second um, to all these different use cases, calling out, right, the different colors here represent what we call sort of realms of clusters of use cases that come together. Um, and we launched it. And it was perfect, and thank you for coming. That was the end of it, no. Um, it didn't work that way. <laughs> it worked pretty well, it worked pretty well, but every once in a while, you'd pop open the chart and it would look like this. So in the previous chart, we were looking at sort of like average response time to any arbitrary query, sub 40 milliseconds. But when we would get paged on it, and we would come in and open up the charts like this, that's seconds, that sucks. <laughs> These are, this wall here is a wall of timeouts and a wave of congestion in the service. So we had to figure out where this was coming from and the thing that motivated me personally the most was this conversation with our other developers. 
my workload hasn't changed at all. Why am I suddenly timing out on all these queries? I'm not sending you more traffic. The complexity hasn't gone up. What's wrong with the service? So this question um, is what's driving us to say, now we've launched a service that we know in theory has the capacity to serve all our use cases, but why do we run into these unhealthy congested states? As we set out to figure out um, a better solution here for maintaining the health of our service, we drew inspiration from these two sources really specifically. So this is like my thank you slide. Um, John Moore at Strange Loop 2017 has a really great talk on capacity management. It goes into a lot of the theory behind um, what we're gonna talk about today. So I watched that talk probably 10 times over the course of several months as we're working on these problems. And then Netflix, um, this blog post, and I can link to it later, um, explains how they manage concurrency and concurrency limits in an ad adaptable way. It also links to the open source library that they published in Java um, that we drew heavily on to adapt to our Python-based services. So these two were, were great source material for solving this problem. So we'll get, to, we'll get to some of how these solutions work, but I wanna talk a little bit about context here um, initially for us and look at the request flow in our service. So it's a gRPC based service. We're working in Python here and reading this left to right, the clients will issue a request. We route those requests through an Envoy proxy layer. That hits a cluster of our service pods, which is where the bulk of the unique work in the service happens. And those pods are talking to a ClickHouse cluster um, where we actually store the data, where we land the data. We get the data back from ClickHouse, get our SQL results back, do some post-processing again in the service, so there's a loop there, and then we ship the results all the way back to the client. Now to understand this flow a little bit deeper, this is a little bit more about what's happening inside the service itself, inside those server pods. So in this gRPC, the Python gRPC implementation, what happens is when we get that client request, uh, there's a thread pool executor that's gonna submit the request and worker threads that we've configured will pick up that work. Now that, that looks like the query, right? That they, gets picked up by one of these threads. The work, that thread that's working on it will also grab a connection out of the shared connection pool, then generates SQL that we need to execute, sends the SQL over the wire to ClickHouse, gets the data back, Again, we hit a shared resource around the CPU for results processing, running on all these threads. This is like a view of one single pod, and we ship the data back. So within this box, within this big outline box, there, what I wanted to sort of express here is that there are a few different places where we fan out, but then come back together in terms of resources. So that becomes really interesting to unpack as we're troubleshooting this. Any, any step along the way is initially our sort of suspected bottleneck here. But what I also want you to think about as we start to develop what concurrency, control, concurrency means and concurrency control is, is that when we draw the box, everything that's kind of inside the box and maybe even including reaching over to that database side counts as work in progress, work in flight. And that's gonna be a big deal, a uh, big concept for us to to work with here. So let's look at this a little bit about how those, if we draw that big box, how requests are queued and processed. And I have a very simplified model um, that I want us to start with here to think about a healthy state of processing work out of a queue. So in my made up example here, we've got four, four requests in flight, four, four units of work in progress. Each one of them comes with a deadline, which is a feature of those requests when we receive them. They send the query, but they also send a deadline, a timeout, for a, where the client expects an answer back by. So we've got four requests in the queue. Each one has a four second deadline, and our service is chugging along, processing one request per second. In this state, we won't see any timeouts, right? The first, at t, if we start at T0, first request gets processed at T1, 
time after one second, the second request gets processed at time two, et cetera. And so we can get all four in with their deadline. We can get, we're in a healthy balanced state. We get the work done. If we look at an unhealthy state, right, one way to be in an unhealthy state here is having more work in flight, more work in the queue than we think we can process. So now if we're looking at eight, we won't get to that fifth request, the sixth request, we won't get to those inside their four second deadline if that's the rate that we're processing. Because there are now too many requests in the queue for us to actually touch and actually get to. So those last four in red, those are the ones that are gonna time out. And the problem here is they're gonna die and time out before we get to work on them. So this is where the client starts to see those long deadline exceeded errors in our, in our wall, wall of timeouts. Another unhealthy state we can get into, our processing rate changes, right? So instead of having a long stat of incoming requests, what if it suddenly takes twice as long to process each request? So now we've got some kind of, in that black box, some kind of degraded performance. And again, in this context, we're talking about queries, right? It could be query complexity. It could be a bunch of different queries with different complex, with, that are more expensive, just by like within the tolerance of our service, expected use case, but what if a bunch of them arrive at the same time, slow down our processing rate, our throughput, our output here for this service? So now, where we could do four before, the last two there are gonna time out because it takes longer to get everything through the queue. I wanna lean on Netflix here for a second and uh, I'm gonna read this whole thing. So uh, it's, it's really useful because it touches all these core concepts, right? So according to Netflix, concurrency is nothing more than the number of requests a system can service at any given time and is normally driven by a fixed resource such as CPU. So that's in our model, we identified a bunch of shared contentious resources. A system's concurrency is normally calculated using Little's Law, which states, for a system at a steady state, concurrency is the product of the average service time and the average service rate. So our incoming requests and our outgoing processing time. Any request in excess of this concurrency cannot immediately be serviced and must be queued or rejected. With that said, some queuing is necessary as it enables full system utilization and in spite of non-uniform request and arrival and service time, which I'll show you again, we have buffer for that inside this system. Systems fail when no limit is enforced on this queue, such as during prolonged periods of time when arrival rate exceeds exit rate, as we saw. As the queue grows, so will latency until all requests start timing out and the system will ultimately run out of memory and crash. If left unchecked, latency increases start adversely affecting its callers, leading to cascading failures throughout the system. And the number of times my head was in my hands reading this description and recognizing that that's what we were doing to our callers, this is a pretty succinct description. So at this point, our mindset shift is like, okay, when we've had these waves of timeouts and congestion in our system, now I start to see because we weren't enforcing any limits here. So what do the limits on this system start to look like? And if we know what our limit is for in-flight requests, amount of work we can do at any one given time, then we have to start to say at the front door, we can accept or reject new work. And that's what we start to get into. So here's an example, right? we need to be able to ask this accept or reject question at the front of the queue. So if we go back to our queuing problem here, right, now we interject the question. New request comes in, can I, should I add it to the queue? Should I start working on it? Or should I make it go away, right? In this scenario, yeah, I can accept it. And the, the thing to start thinking about here, and we're gonna, we're gonna build this idea a little bit, is what does a rejection mean before you enqueue it? The consequences of that rejection, something we're gonna talk about as we go through this, because it gets really interesting. We know the alternative already, right? If we accept work we can't do, it's gonna die in the queue, it's gonna time out. And we know that creates a degraded experience for the end callers, 
So we're going to talk about how it gets interesting to think about what happens if you reject it. But here, we can take it. Whereas, one more comes in, we think we're at our capacity for doing work at any one moment, we got to say no. We got to reject it. And the difference here is in the speed of the response to the client, right? The rejection here is going to happen in a couple milliseconds. It comes in, you get a message back that says, no, I can't process this right now. Much different scenario to be in as the caller than it is if you are sitting there waiting for no answer and you bail on your own. So that's bad. This is an improvement. And the thing that you start to see, actually, if you zoom out a little bit more into our whole cluster, there's a really different phenomenon that emerges if you're doing load shedding, early rejection. So play, this is a little bit, now we have two servers in play here. Let me just walk through this for a second, and, and we can kind of understand the benefits of what happens now. So we start on the far left with our request, right? Comes in and is routed to server one. Server one says, no, I'm at capacity. I'm going to reject this request. Well, in our gRPC ser client server semantics, it's possible to configure retries inside the client. So the rejection from server one doesn't bubble all the way back up to be handled in application code. The request can be, you will reject it with a retriable exception, and we can recognize that retriable exception within the client within this loop, and quickly retry. And because of the cluster configuration and topology, there's a good chance now that the retry hits server two or some other server in the cluster, right? And if that server has capacity, the request goes through. So we've just gone from a failure, a retry, and a successful request without talking back to, without sending that all the way back to the caller without touching that in application code. And the time difference is the key here, right? So it's opaque, <laughs> opaquely retried and successfully processed. The rejection only costs us a tiny little bit of time. And it's not like the caller had to wait five seconds for a timeout and then figure out how to try it again. So we've essentially created a routing mechanism to find a happy path to execute this request and fulfill the request. If you play this out across the cluster, we're going to look at some graphs in, in a little bit here. You'll see that this routing mechanism actually finds, it becomes a utilization mechanism, right? Because we don't know the mix of queries. We don't know the mix of use cases. We uh, sort of, in general, have provisioned the service for what we expect to get for traffic. But we don't have to control the complexity of analyzing a request before it comes in and says, oh, you go over here to this server. Oh, you go over to that, that server. That's a much, much harder problem. And here, we create a tight loop where we actually seek to a place where we have capacity to do the work. It's pretty cool. You could stop here. This was the decision that we made, right? If we can track how many in-flight requests we have, and we know the number, the maximum number of requests we can process at any one time. On every server, by the way, this requires no coordinated state, no shared state between the servers, right? Each server is tracking this in isolation, which is really nice. On any server, you can assert when a request comes in, can I accept this request? Here's my limit. Here's my current workload. Yeah, I have headroom to accept it. Otherwise, reject it. With gRPC, you could stop here. Right? There's even a tunable in your server configuration that says, hey, you, you can define the max number of in-flight RPCs that you want to support on this server. You could stop there and declare half of this problem solved. Right? Anytime you get a spike in incoming data or a slowdown that leads the number of in-flight requests to creep up, you'll eventually get there if all you did was configure a ceiling, because you'd have this, this solution. So that's pretty good. But we want to do better. <laughs> we want to adapt to the situation. And there, there are three factors we really want to adapt to here. right? We've talked about adapting to increased traffic. Cool. We've talked about arbitrary, uncontrollable complexity landing in any one spot. right? Some really expensive queries to process, 
all get routed to the same server. We're not introspecting the queries to do our routing. So there's a chance that a lot of expensive work lands on the same place all at the same time. We want to be able to adapt to that and say, don't send us any more work right now. That's too much. And then the third scenario that we want to account for and adapt to is our, sorry, it's maybe easier to see on here, downstream database stuff too, right? If we have slowdowns there, we lose a database server, um, whatever kind of contention, I don't, you start to not care what it is, but you want to be able to adapt to it and say either we're seeing it at the front door, at the back door, or because it's slower to process at this moment in time. So all of our adaptive mechanisms have to roll up into some way to measure that. Um, and Daniel at his talk yesterday on queues said exactly what I wanted to say for this one. The one metric that you need to measure all of these is latency, right? This outline, make it a black box. And from a caller's perspective, I just care how long it takes to get the data back everything collapses down to latency in this scenario. So we're gonna add a latency loop on top of our normal request processing. Now, I know there's a lot of boxes, but let me try to, let me try to unpack it here for a second. Um, so starting at the bottom left, right? Same thing we've done already. We issue the request, accept it in green, reject it in red. Cool, we know how that loop works. Once we finish our normal processing, we measure, right? We sample how long did that request take to process. Now, remember, we've got the mixed workload here. So one request is a lousy sample, right? Maybe this came from a really quick query, and so we take a low sample. That doesn't really tell us about the health of the system. So the way this code is designed, we aggregate a sample window. We aggregate a bunch of requests. And what we do is we calculate an aggregate over that window. And the way that trends actually tells us about the health of the service. So we start recording latency, round trip time, RTT. I'll, I'll use those all interchangeably, so forgive me for that. We aggregate up and take a measurement that gives us a bead on how the server is doing, how the service is doing. And then we feed that into an algorithm that will help us take that current aggregated latency and adjust our limit up and down. So now we have an adaptive way to set the ceiling. So at the end of the day, it's still, what's our limit? How much work are we doing? And do I have room to take on more? Same question, but now the ceiling moves up and down based on the current set of conditions. What we are using today as, a, as an adaptive algorithm is called AIMD, additive increase, multiplicative decrease. I'll show you this in a few different ways. But basically, when we get a signal that we're healthy, we can make a decision to expand our capacity. But as soon as we start to get a signal that ah, we're not doing so good, we're slowing down our processing, we back way off. Right, so in the code, Every time we do an update, which is reevaluating that window, we say, hey, is the RTT, the round trip time, the aggregated observation window for us, like P95 latency over the last 300 requests, or I take it reading every three seconds or something, if that's exceeding the latency target that we want to hit, we need to back off. And instead of stepping down limit minus one, we say, no, apply a back off factor. So I, we may have blown past our latency target and our fifth, you know, we'd be working at fit on 50 requests as our ceiling, back off 50%, now our limit's 25. So we aggressively back off. Likewise, if we have a positive signal, we have more capacity to process, we can bump up our limit. Now, this is some, some Nuance there in terms of when we, we don't automatically increase, right? Like if the service is really sleepy and we have a potentially high target, we'll stay kind of close to where the service is operating at. We don't always need to just keep going up and up and up. And we keep it within sane min max boundaries. We're almost at an answer to this question. So I wanna just call out one more box in the loop here. 
right? So this last box, it's a, I know it's small, but um, after we do our recalculation loop and come up with a new limit, we consider that our global limit, right? So if our currently uh, the health of our service tells us we can support 50 concurrent requests, we do one more step. And that is, we, after we derive the global limit, we calculate partitions. And partitions, right, allow us to assign a percentage of that global limit to sets of incoming use cases, incoming callers. So say we've configured this service so that our public API can take up 20% of the request volume compared to our UI that maybe gets 2%, right? Every time we recalculate the total limit, there's a second set of calculations that applies the pre-configured percentage by partition. And every call that comes in gets mapped to a partition. So we can understand, for example, the API request comes in, we say, how many in-flight requests are you allowed to have right now, API? It's, say, the number's 10. If this is the ninth request, we can take one more, or if this is going to be the 11th request, we reject it. But sometimes we don't. <laughs> the, only, the, other, the other nuance here, and, and ask me about this more later because there's a lot to it, is that if there's spare global capacity and nobody else is using it and our partition is going to exceed a limit, we can take it anyway. So there's some cool stuff that happens with utilization here. The service has the capacity. It's not blocking anybody else. We can use it up. But when you think about it in the other direction, this is where we have guarantees for our callers. Because when we're in a sort of shutdown situation, lockdown situation, where we're maxed out, the fact that the partitions have specific configured limits means that I always have a slot to serve that UI request. If that's the policy that I put in place, that UI has X percentage of my global limit as a policy, then that means I'm always reserving some capacity. When I'm backing off, backing off, backing off, it, it gives you guarantees across your different use cases, which is why I can go to my developers and say, yes, we can isolate you from your noisy neighbor now and guarantee you a certain amount of throughput in this system. I hope that makes sense. That's a little bit, it gets a little bit tricky. So what did we see when we took this live? First thing is that if we zoom in, you know, this is like a five, 10 minute window on a single server. We start to see spikes in RTT, in latency. These are the measurements that we've instrumented around the concurrency control mechanism. So this is now, again, I don't know what the cause of the latency is. Is it the mix of the workload that lands on it? Is it some downstream issue? Is it too much congestion? I don't have to care. I just look at this latency and the expectation from everything we've talked about is that if that latency is going up, my limit should be going down. And I can't tell you how satisfying it is to see this direct <laughs> cause and effect in a production chart after you've worked on all these prototypes and you've thought about all this theory. Latency goes up, limit goes down. And if you notice then what happens once we've backed off and give, given this server basically enough time to drain the work in flight and work at a recoverable rate, this is the, 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 the global limit, right? The mechanism is kicking in, looking at the latency feedback and saying, oh yeah, the, see how the limit starts to creep back up and step back up? That's what we wanna see. The other really cool effect that we observed here is this chart. Right? So these are the aggregated window measurements of latency across the entire cluster or a subset of these servers. And look at the range. This validates this routing thing that we've been working on here. Right? You've got a huge range in latency because all of the servers are handling different workloads. And so what we can see is we really do have these hotspots and with the sort of retry mechanism that we we're talking about between the client and server, we can see that that one that's topping out at like 600 milliseconds in that, that latency window, right? Obviously we know that's gonna start locking down the limit. 
and it's going to start rejecting requests. But there's tons of servers just hopping along there at 100 milliseconds. So we have a place to do work, and we have, a, we have, a, we, we have better utilization basically across the cluster because we can route to somewhere that can do the work efficiently. So that's a cool effect to observe. Finally, um, our, our latency, you know, we see spikes now, not walls. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and even when we see like some of these are within tolerance of expected behavior, right? There are definitely just definitionally slower long running queries that we want for more complex dashboards or report generation. But we didn't, we stopped seeing this like mass of everybody blocking the queue and timing out all our other users. So we got to spiky. Um, yeah. And that is it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.